Hello everyone, how are you this morning? I'm so glad to see you here today. My name is Nino and it is my pleasure to be your host on this blue stage for the next two days. As your host, I will be at your disposal for everything you need, so please find me during the breaks or inside this room at any moment. If for some reason you cannot find me, there is always someone from the Hip Space crew running around in these red t-shirts or one of our volunteers in the blue ones. Uh, so, let's get this show on the road. Uh, also, as a host, I have a great pleasure and honor to announce our speakers. So, let's hear it from Milan. He will give you a talk in the next 50 minutes, and I hope you have a great time today and tomorrow also. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. This, does it work? Okay. okay. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Are you guys ready to break apart some Java applications? Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, let's just close the room and let's uh, keep it quiet so everyone can have an hour of sleep. That's, works better? Right, that's what I thought. Okay, again, are you ready to tr break apart some Java applications? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, so my name is Milan Jankov, and I work for LifeRay as developer advocate. And out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of LifeRay? Not that many, okay, but still. So if you Google around or ask people that know LifeRay, they, you will find that uh, uh, LifeRay is a portal, which is what historically we used to be. We used to have like one big portal platform that we delivered to customers. Um, and at some point in time, we reached the, the, the point where this huge platform was like so big already that we couldn't develop it further anymore in the sense like you touch something here, something over there breaks. Um, so we started like uh, redesigning it, split it into a bunch of different um, uh, smaller open source frameworks. Uh, Life Ray itself it's op has always been open source, so open source is kind of our thing. And as we started breaking it apart, it turns out that it was so linked, like all the pieces of the code were so kind of tightly coupled with each other that the process of decomposing it was actually a nightmare. Um, so it took us almost two years, no, over two years, uh, to actually bring it down into a platform that we can give developers to, you know, build applications on top of it uh, and a bunch of other services uh, uh, around it. Uh, and this also brought us to a situation where it's really hard to explain what the library platform is. Uh, because people typically ask me like, okay, so what do you guys do? What, what is the, the, the platform? And I'm like, well, you know, it's like it, it gives you um, a nice development environment where you can use ready to uh, uh, services that you can compose your applications of. And then everyone is like, oh, you guys doing microservices? I was like, uh, no. no, not really. Oh, uh, so you're doing SOA? Uh, no. Uh, so what do you do? So the problem with this approach is Everyone seems to be looking for this one word that's going to describe the thing that you do. Uh, we're so hooked into this, like, give me the one word and let me know what it is. And oftentimes, things don't fit in one word, and this is certainly the case for us. The other title of this talk is uh, Cleaning and Tidying Children's Room. How many of you are parents? Not a lot. Okay, so that's an experience that is in front of many of you. So when you have kids, which I have three of, uh, you reach the point where you tell them, you know, you need to go and clean your room. And they look, they, they look at you with, a, with this specific um, like, uh, face, which I cannot mimic, which goes like, kind of like this, like, what do you mean? It's clean. It's like, it's, it's, you know, clean is a perception. Uh, and in their mind, uh, their room is clean. So, you need to figure out a way to actually make them see what do you mean by clean because arguing on words level is pointless, right? Um, and so this is a challenge, the same challenge that I have with developers. I uh, used to do a lot of consulting. I still do a lot of consulting, not that much as I used to, but when I go to customers and I look at their code and I'm like, oh my God, you guys really need to do something with that code. And, and they go like, what do you mean? It's perfect. Okay, and so how do you explain what, the, what do you mean by making the code cleaner, making it less uh, uh, dependent on, on random things, making it more coherent uh, and stuff like that? It's pretty much the same exercise like explaining it to kids. How many of you are familiar with the Conway's Law? 
Seriously? Like, okay, like only a few people. That keeps surprising me. I thought that in the microservices era, Conway is low. It's like everyone's number one rule. So basically, Conway is low says that any organization that designs software inevitably is going to produce software which is going to reflect the communication structure of that company. Uh, and it's very powerful law, which most people think, tend to think, oh, it does not apply to us. Trust me, it does. But what is important, what, is, what, is, what I realized about that law is that you can reverse it. So the reverted Conway's law, which I'm going to be using today to uh, kind of demonstrate, to make things more understandable, goes the other way around. It says, well, if that's the case, if Conway's law applies, then we can get any application and represent it as a business model. Uh, and then we can demonstrate how some ways of uh, designing applications make more sense than others. And I hope to demonstrate that to you today. All the code that you're going to see, because I'm going to be showing you a lot of code today, uh, is on GitHub. So if you want to uh, go and play with it later on, you're going to have the slides, you're going to have the URL. Um, I'm going to be going through a lot of code fairly quickly, and it's not the point of this presentation for you to understand every single line of it. The point is to understand how different pieces connect with, with other pieces. And this is what we're going to be focusing on. Um, uh, and the code itself, as I said, you can, you can uh, download it from GitHub. So meet Hari. Hari wants to start a business, and he figures out he's going to be in the cleaning business, so he's going to clean houses. So he has a van, and he has some tools, and he has some supplies. Um, that's everything he needs. Now he needs customers. So the customers are going to call Hari, say, hey, Hari, come clean my house. And the Hari would be like, sure, put the stuff in the van, go there, and clean it. So let's see how that works in terms of code. So here is your... First approach, business, hurry, uh, I hardly can see my monitor here. Here is your hurry. Uh, don't need that. Can you see the code? I hope you do. Okay, so here is hurry. Hurry is, uh, he has some cleaning tools, he has some supplies. What hurry can do is he can clean houses, right? And what does this mean is he puts the stuff uh, he has the tools, he has the supplies, puts them in the van, uh, then drives to some address, uh, then cleans the house, then drives back home, uh, well, to the office, uh, then do some bookkeeping. Yeah, it's the typical thing that you would say how you do house cleaning. But Hari is also a person, like a human, like every one of us. And now that he has a van, he can actually also borrow this van to someone, right? Um, so um, Harry doesn't want to borrow his van to everyone, though. He checks if the, the, that's the friend, and he only borrows it to friends. Same thing goes with his tools. He can borrow his tools to someone if he decides to do so. So this is how we described Harry uh, in this uh, um, very uh, simplistic way. Um, uh, for every single example that you're going to see later on, there is another thing here called client. Uh, please ignore that. This is just the, something that gives me a shell so I can interact with the application. It's not part of the application uh, itself. So let's do that. Let's go to, uh, I don't see here, uh, house cleaning example one. Uh, and I have the script so I can run things. Uh, and I also need to specify which Java version I want to run things with. Uh, so I'm going to run this with Java 8. And you'll see why that's important later on. So here is the house cleaning. And I can say, hey, Hari, can you clean my house? And here goes the whole process. Hari picks the cleaning supplies, the tools, put them in the van, drives, cleans the house, drives back, uh, and so forth. So it's all good. Uh, I can say, uh, well, Hari, can I, you, can I borrow your van? And Harry says, no, because I don't know who you are. I was like, oh, how do you, what do you mean? I'm your friend, remember? And he says, oh, yeah, sure. Here's, here's the van. Uh, you can borrow it. Uh, easy and super simple and whatnot. Um, the problem with that approach is it's simple. And that's the big benefit of it. Because if you think about it, 
Whatever goes wrong with that application, it's super easy to debug. It's one class. Whatever breaks, whatever happens, you go to that one class, you find it, and you fix it. So debugging is a piece of cake, but you cannot evolve. In, in, if Harry wants to grow his business, right, you are sentenced to throwing everything into Harry, and eventually you're going to reach the, moment, the, 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 the situation where Harry cannot handle it by himself anymore. So Harry goes, let's, let's get some kind of separation. So we're going to have Ronald, and Ronald's going to do all the, you know, the customer communication part. Uh, so he's going to deal with customers, and then he's going to make sure that they pay properly and so forth. Uh, and then he's going to have this order form, and then they have pass it to Harry. And then Harry says, like, well, all these things, well, they're mine, but they're not, you know, in me. So we just separate them into a thing called garage, uh, right? So here is this... Um, here we go with the, the second approach to deal with that. Um, so in here, uh, you will see that we have Hurry, which can do things. Uh, we also have the garage now. And this is what Hurry searched the uh, industry. Uh, and he figured out everyone is using a so-called smart garage. A smart garage is one that allows you to do things like this, select from blah, blah, blah. Not that he really needs one, but that's what everyone else is doing, right? So he decided to also use one of those. Uh, and there is also Ronald here, which you can see uh, Ronald is basically is just checking the order form. And then when someone says, well, clean the house, um, uh, he basically passes this to Harry, and then Harry goes and cleans the house. Super simple, but we have some kind of separation in here. Um, so let's try that again. Let me close this here. Don't need that. Um, so I'm going to go to house cleaning 2. Uh, and I'm going to run this again with Java 8. And I say cleaning my house. And you'll see now Ronald takes the cleaning form, uh, the request, takes, handle, takes care of it, passes it to Harry, and Harry goes and do the cleaning. So can I now borrow the command? I say, uh, borrow, borrow van, and I can borrow the van right away. It doesn't even ask me if I'm a friend or not. So, how uh, well how that happened? Well, that happened because what we have in this scenario is this: Ronald can now bypass Harry. He can go grab the car or the tools or whatever from the garage and give it to whoever he finds suitable. He doesn't, you know, the the hardest check of whether you're friend or not does not apply anymore here, right? And uh, Harry goes like, no, no, no. This is not how we do things here. And if I am to grow my business and have, you know, hundreds of Ronalds and a bunch of other people around me, this is not going to be an environment that I can control. So he looks around and says, well, we need to figure out something different. But before we need to do something different, let's, uh, sorry, um, Let's, uh, yeah, so we need to do something different. So he decides to actually divide this in a proper way as businesses do. So he's going to have the company, and in the company, he's also going to hire Andre, which is an assistant. Andre is going to help him with like preparing the tools and stuff. Ronald's going to stay on the front. Uh, uh, and uh, to serve customers, and then he decides also to divide. Uh, it doesn't make sense to keep everything in the garage, so we have the garage for the van and storage for the uh, uh, for the tools. Now, what you don't see here because of the resolution of the uh, projector, I guess, is that Andre is kind of a gray normally, uh, um, and the reason is, is is gray on this picture is because Andre is hidden. So. It's protected. Ronald cannot talk to Andre anymore uh, directly. And how do you do these kind of things in, in Java? Is, let's go to example three. So here is the company. And inside the company, we have Hari uh, and we have Andre. Now, what you will notice about Andre is that he is not publicly available to everyone, that only Hari can talk to him. Right? So in this case, Harry kind of ensures that Andre cannot be uh, asked to do things that he's not supposed to do. 
Uh, the rest is pre so this is the assets here where all the you know the garage and the storage and all the tools are, uh, and from um, uh, everything else is in the uh, where where we are. Uh, so this is the assets, and uh, this is the company, and uh, this is the client, the client that calls, and this is the front end, the front office. I barely see my screen. Sorry for me jumping around. Where this is where uh, Ronald is uh, in here, right? So it's the same concept, just you know, putting things in a different way and trying to limit access to uh, to them. And so just to uh, so that you're sure that all this works, actually. Um, let's uh, go to housekeeping, uh, house cleaning, uh, example three, and do the same thing. So just to demonstrate, um, so again, clean the house. Sure, it works the same way. Can I borrow the van now? Um, sure, I can. Again, like, okay, we, we changed the way company works, but we didn't prevent this fundamental problem from happening again. Why? Because essentially, regardless of the separation, we have the same issues. Ronald can bypass both Harry and Andre and go to the garage and the storage. Now, you may be tempted to say, well, that's because you did it wrong. That's because garage and storage are publicly available to everyone. And I would say, yeah, right. But if you try to make them not being publicly available to everyone, you essentially prevent Harry and Andre from accessing them. So there's no way for you. It's either available for everyone or it's available for no one unless they're sitting in the same place. That's how Java works. Um, so there is the, 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 this concept is kind of um, not solving the problem that we see. But you may think this is a strange uh, concept. Like, who does that? You do, I do, we all do. It's been the universal, what I call BBC software design, box, box, cylinder. And for those of you old enough, you know that we've been told for decades that this is the best way to design software applications. Now, we don't call it box, box, cylinder. We call it front-end business logic database or whichever other names you want to put uh, on, on these boxes. But essentially, this is how we've been doing applications for I don't know how many years. Um, well, clearly, this approach has some uh, issues. So some years ago, some smart people said, well, let's you know, abandon this and we'll try it differently. So Harry looks into those researches and says, OK, let's live structure the company again. So there's going to be the company, and there's going to be me in this garage. There's going to be the back office, where is Andre and the storage, and there's going to be Ronald in it. And the Ronald's going to talk to us. Fine, let's see how that works. OK, so in terms of code, uh, this is now the new structure. So we have the back office, uh, where is Andre and the storage. Uh, and you can see now Andre speaks publicly to everyone, but the storage is, you know, it's not publicly available. So, you know, now uh, um, uh, Ronald cannot access it. Um, and so we also have uh, the company, which, also, which only has Harry in the garage. Uh, and we have the front office, uh, where is Ronald? Fine, so how that works. Uh, okay, let's exit here, clear the screen for you, and we're going to go to house cleaning four, do the very same thing, and that's just make sure everything works. Uh, clean the house, yeah, great, works. Uh, borrow van. Oops, I can't borrow the van now because it goes to Hari. That's super cool, that's what we wanted. Can I borrow the tools though? Sure, I can. So we protected the van, but we didn't protect the tools. How how that happened? Well, that happened because now Ronald can go talk to Andre directly, and he doesn't. Andre doesn't really know how Harry's validation uh, works, right? Um, and he will say now, okay, let's put all the storage 
uh, and all the other things under the protection of Hari. That's one way to solve it. The other way is, let's introduce this check on every single person that potentially Ronald can, can talk to. Uh, and you're getting to what I call the universal microservices architecture, where you get a box and you put everything that is relevant in that box. That includes your database, your JVM, and everything else, right? And then you have multiple of those boxes, and then you reach the point where you, you realize that each and every box has to talk to each and every other box, and cross-cutting concepts like securing access or um, using shared resources is all of a sudden a nightmare to manage. And not only that, but in, in general, as this grows, it gets more and more complicated to properly manage this. So Harry goes like, well, no, I don't want to manage my company this way. Let's try something different. And so he goes and looks into the other researchers, which says, uh, well, you can... Uh, uh, you've been doing it wrong because you've been focusing on the wrong things. You've been focusing on entities, on Harry and Ronald and tools and, uh, you know, and Van and whatever. And this is not the most important part of the business. The most important part of the business is the process, how things work, right? So he restructures the thing, says, okay, the company has all these things. It has staff, it has assets, it has whatever it needs to have. But this is not relevant to anyone out there. People out there, they don't need to know how your company internally is organized and structured. All they care is how they interact with your company, what they can request and what they can receive from that company. That's all they care about. And this is where you come up with the thing that here is called use cases. And so you say, well, this company provides cleaning services. You don't need to know how that works. You don't need to know how it is implemented. You need to know that this is how you request to clean the house, and this is how you get your house clean. And this is what your front office basically uses to communicate, basically says, well, I have a customer that requests this type of service. Now, by doing this, you are saying basically, you are opening yourself to the future because you can now say, well, tomorrow I can introduce another use case. Let's say clean backyard or clean a pool or whatever. And I can still do this different use case with the same amount of resources that I have at the company at this very moment. Right? You also open yourself to different um, uh, front office options. You don't have to put a person in a place, but you can say, I can you know, get requests from the internet, for example, or by mail or whatever. Right? So you're decoupling what your company structure is from how it operates, from how, what, what the connection points, the entry points to, to it are. So let's see how that goes in terms of code. Um, this is example five. So here we have the company, uh, and if you look into how it is structured, now we have these things called in Java packages. So in this package, we have all the assets. Uh, in here, we have all the job positions. Now, interesting thing about job positions uh, is that they are, as in any company, just a description. So if you look at the cleaner, for example, uh, it, or, or it's an interface in Java, or a job description, what we call it in the real world. It does not define the actual process of doing things. It basically tells you if someone is in this role, those are the things they are supposed to be uh, capable of doing. Um, so then uh, we have uh, things like processes. And so there is the clean house process, which is super simple. Just get the cleaner and ask him to clean the house. There is also a transport process, for example, which basically says get the van, load the stuff in it, and then drive uh, to some place. It describes the process, right? Well, because you need to communicate between processes and entities, there's some kind of shared stuff in here as well. And then you have the stuff. And then in the stuff, you say, well, Andre, as an assistant, and because he's an assistant, he needs to be able to do the things that assistants do, and this is how he does it. And Hari is uh, both cleaner uh, and accountant, because why not? Um, and so forth. So this is how your company uh, actually internally is designed, but no one cares about that. 
What people care about is how they can interact with your company. So here is customer use case, which basically says company provides clean customer house, and it doesn't provide anything else. It doesn't provide borrow a van. It doesn't provide borrow tools because that's not what our company do. That's what our company do. Okay, and then from the front office perspective, uh, well, you uh, just have uh, customer use cases, clean the house after you verify it, that you get the payment. So, will this work? Okay, let's exit that and let's go to cleaning house five and do this one more time. So, clean house, and here I've changed the UI a little bit, so I now provide the uh, amount of money that uh, is paid, and you will see uh, Ronald uh, still, still gets to the right people, except we're now operating in terms of processes. It doesn't really matter whether that's gonna be processed by Ronald or someone else who is in that role. Can I do uh, borrow, borrow stuff, though? Borrow the van. Damn it, I can still borrow the van. How come that happened? Well, that happened because we have smart developers working at the front office and they figured out that even though all these assets are not supposed to be directly used, even though they are supposed to go through the use cases, well, they can still freely access those things. So they can bypass the use cases and just go and grab from, say, database or whatever uh, they want, right? And there is virtually no way for you to prevent them from doing that, in Java at least, uh, unless you put all these things in one package and make some kind of something package private. But you don't want to have one big package of everything. You want to have, you don't want to sacrifice your company structure, internal company structure, just because some people outside are smart enough uh, to, to figure it out and take advantage of it. So what is your option? Let's try to hide those packages. How do we do that? How can we say, well, we do have this structure in the company, but those things on the right, those gray ones, are not available to anyone else but to the company itself. You can't do this with Java 8. You can only do that, well, no, that's not true. You can, but not with the standard things that Java provides you, and we'll get to that later. You can do this with Java 9 and the newly introduced in Java 9 and every other newer Java uh, JPMS the Java platform uh, modular system. And this is what we're gonna do here. So code-wise, example six and example five are identical. No changes, everything is the same. The only difference is, if you look into the company, uh, into any of this, you have this thing called module info. And in this module info, you basically say, okay, I uh, have these packages, that I export to other people to use, and everything that is not here, it cannot be used by anyone else. Um, and then you go to, say, use cases, and you have the same thing. Those are the packages from the use cases that other people can use, and those are the modules that the use cases module requires in order to properly function. So you have now another level of abstraction. Basically, this module depends on that model, and these things are hidden, and these things are available for other modules. Same thing if you go to the front end, uh, to the front office, sorry, uh, and you look in the module info, well, you export a package, and you require some other modules. So how that works? Um, that works. This uh, it's clean here. And uh, we go to house cleaning six in this case. And let's compile this thing. Uh, M, uh, clean package. And I'm going to use Java 8 to compile this thing. 
Now, Java 8 has absolutely no idea of what modules are. So if I run this again, um, uh, and I can say, oh, yeah, uh, clean the house, just to show you, works. Uh, but I can say, uh, borrow van, and you can, see, you can see it still works. Now, uh, because Java 8 doesn't have any idea about how this uh, modular thing works. So let's now compile this with Java 9. The same thing goes with Java 10 and potentially Java 11. I don't, haven't tried with Java 11, but I would assume it's the exact same thing. Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't even compile. Why it doesn't compile? Well, it doesn't compile because it complains that this thing uses some internal assets kind of thing that's not visible. And that's exactly what we want. And that tells us yeah, our code is wrong. Someone's doing something wrong. So we now need to go to the front office, figure out what's, what's wrong. So let's open the front office. And you say, hey, wait a minute, front office. How come you actually offer to borrow a van? That's not something that our company does. So the only option for you is to basically force them to not do that anymore. And yeah, it's Java. You have to take care of imports as well. So now when you say, when you enforce the rules, this is by design, not something that you're supposed to do. Uh, wait a second, I'm missing up, mixing up my code. Uh, clear. So you can compile this with Java 9 again. And now it works. Now it compiles and now it tells you it's all good. Now, the, the flip side of that is, of course, uh, you cannot run this with Java uh, 8 anymore. So if you try this, sorry about that. Um, so you have to run this with Java 9 on modular path. And if you do this, here is your application, and you can still request to clean the house, which still works, and you cannot borrow the van anymore nor the tools, and this is exactly what we wanted to achieve. It took us six iterations to get there, and a newer feature from Java 9 to actually be able to finally achieve the goal that we wanted uh, from the very beginning. But then we realized we have another problem. What's going to happen if our van broke? Like, you know, these things, they tend to break. So I have this status file here, which simulates a van failure. And it says it's van functional. So I'm going to just say the van just broke. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to run my clean house again. And hey, it doesn't work anymore because we don't have a van. And we cannot go to the customer house. So what do we do in this case? You know, our uh, van broke, so the business is on hold, we can't do business anymore. You know that this is not how business operates, right? So business uh, needs to have a backup plan for failures, for things like that. Well, and, and our design is not actually helping us in resolving this. The only way for us to solve this is actually go change the source code, recompile, uh, and um, uh, use something else, some other means of transportation which is not what you want to do on a live system. Um, and, and, and you can't actually do it on a large enough large, uh, uh, live systems in a reasonable time. But you can change the design and you can say, how about have this abstraction called services? And then whatever the company does, we expose it as services and then we just consume those services. And OK, now I get it. Half of you are already thinking in terms of REST and Docker and Kubernetes and you know, all these things. No, I'm talking about pure Java services here, like without all the complexity of the distributed world, which you can throw in if you want to, but you don't have to. So let me show you a different approach to the same problem. So this is the next example. So in here, we have again the company, and we have made a few important changes. First important change is if you look into the processes, 
they are now process definitions. So let's go into the transport process. Well, the transport process is no longer a solid process. It's a definition of a process. It basically says if something is a transport process, it should be able to do those things. And now in here, we have something called internal processes. And here is, for example, internal transport process, which satisfies this definition. It says, well, if I'm a transport process, so this is how I do those things that I'm expected to do. Right now, from the um, use case perspective, uh, you can look at the use cases uh, in here and say a customer use cases. We just used those those processes. So here is a uh, new order process, which is how we receive the um, uh, the, the requests. Here is prepare for cleanup process, and then there is a transport process. So we just use a implementation of a process, which we don't really care about uh, the actual implementation. Unfortunately, uh, that means that you have to use Java services, which comes from um, a Java service loader. How many of you actually are familiar with the uh, Java service loader framework in Java? Mm, one person. And yeah, that that's, keeps surprising me again. I keep asking this question every time I give this and many other talks. Java Service Loader was introduced in Java 6. And yet, um, vast majority of Java developers out there don't even know it exists. So this uses Java Service Loader, which means you have to use a lot of boilerplate code, but it's okay. It works. Now, in Java 9 and, and JPMS and all the future versions of Java, uh, they actually introduced, they moved the definition of, um, of that to the module info. So now in module info, if you get in, in your use cases, you basically say, well, those are the services I use. And where you provide services, say in company, in your module info, you say, I provide a service with an implementation. And this is how the things get wired. You basically, one side says, I want a service. The other side says, well, I provide a service. And they get wired by this you know, big, big boilerplate that you saw there. I'm sorry. OK. So then when you've done this with your architecture, what you can actually do is provide another module which would call a Uber transport. And Uber transport is you go and sign a deal with Uber and say, if my, if my van breaks, I want you to, you know, to use you as a service. And sure enough, uh, in that module info, we also provide a transport process, but with an Uber transport process. It's a different approach to the same process. Okay? So how does, well, unfortunately, uh, Java, uh, a, Java 9's JPMS is not dynamic, so you cannot switch those things at runtime. Um, so you have to go and run all the modules. Uh, wait a second, where is my mouse? Okay. Uh, in, uh, you have to run it with all the modules. Uh, so we're going to just add the Uber transport uh, here right away. Uh, and let's try that. Uh, house cleaning, oops, not here. House cleaning seven. And let's just run this with uh, Java modular uh, runtime. And we say clean house. Yeah, sure, it works. Now let's find the status file and break the van. Uh, and let's try that again. And you'll see, oh, here we go. We still work, it just used different process. We just used Uber to get the customer rather than our own van. And then we fix the van here. Um, and we clean the house again. And here we are again, we are using our own van. So we were able to actually switch processes at runtime. Unfortunately, as I said before, this first of all requires a new version of Java. And second of all, uh, which is more important, uh, requires you to have, uh, sorry, 
you know, that one uh, use cases where it is. Uh, it requires you to have all this boilerplate in here um, that, that's really hard to write if you don't know. So there is a better way to do that, and it's called OSGI. And it's been around for a many, many years, and that was one of the main reasons why it was invented. So the next example is exactly the same in terms of um, end result, but it's developed differently. So in the company, you will see we don't have any module info anymore. Uh, what do we have instead uh, is this processes are again uh, uh, definitions. And we basically say that this package here, we export it. But for example, for the internals, uh, we don't export that package. Also, uh, for the uh, processes, um, for the internal processes, say where they are here, let's, let's get the transport process again. We register this as a, pro as a component, as a service uh, somewhere. And from the uh, uh, use case perspective, uh, which is the boilerplate in the previous example, you basically just reference the process. And in OSGI, we have this thing called service registry. And service registry is going to inject all those things um, into you. So as you can see, all the boilerplate is gone. You're just wiring things together. Um, and let me just demonstrate how that works for you. Um, Okay, and we're going to go to house cleaning eight, uh, and we can now still run this with Java eight. We don't need the modular system anymore. Uh, it's a little bit different shell here. The GoGo -Go shell. It's a, a, a newer version, well, a different version of the one that I was using before. But anyway, uh, I can say clean house for a hundred euro. Uh, and you still you see it works. Now I'm going to go and break the van uh, here, and I'm going to say again, did I save it? Of course not. Uh, and I'm going to say again, clean the house, and it's going to tell me I have no idea how to get there. Pr transport process is not working. Oh, how do I fix this? I'm going to say install. Uh, okay. Install, and I'm going to go to my Uber process, which was built somewhere here. I say I want to use that process instead. And if I look at what my modules are, okay, here it is. It was installed. Let's start it. Right. Okay. Yeah, works good. So, and then I can say now, clean house uh, for 100 euro, and here you go, I'm using Uber. Uh, and I can say, well, you guess what? They just fixed my van. So I go to clean house again, and I'm using my van again. So this is giving me, first of all, a much easier way of writing and wiring things together. Second of all, gives me ability to run with all the versions of Java. Uh, and third of all, gives me dynamism. I can start and stop services at runtime uh, whenever uh, I want. This is the fundamental concept of uh, service-oriented architecture in the JVM in this particular case. You don't have to go through all the um, hassle of setting up Kubernetes and uh, uh, whatever, it's the, the new thing that you do today. I totally get it that uh, you want to, in today's world, you want to do uh, uh, polyglot, cross language and whatnot, and this is not going to solve those problems. Uh, I'm not saying that Kubernetes and containers are useless. They, of course, are and are very powerful. What I'm saying is there are scenarios where you can solve the very same problems in a much easier way just by applying a proper design to your applications and not delegate everything to a third-party technologies which you can't control. The bottom line of this is, and which is what started uh, this talk with, is sometimes you can't fit things in one word. I couldn't have described this to you with one word so that you understand the whole concept. Yet, 
what I see happening is us chasing words to describe things. Uh, a biggest thing in, in, in today's industry is like who coined the word? Um, and that introduces a problem. The problem, uh, for example, let's take, um, I don't know, uh, agile, which is what people uh, recently argue a lot about. The problem with that is a bunch of smart people got together, they figure out the concept of doing things, and they gave it a name. They call it agile. Fast forward a decade, and you have the agile experts all over the place arguing, this is agile, this is not agile. Right? Or say microservices. Oh, microservices are if you use Spring Boot. And if you don't, then it's not microservices. And then we waste our time fighting those battles of is this this or is it not? I couldn't care less. Does it solve a problem or does it not? Does it introduce other problems while solving the problem or not? That's what you should be caring about. Not how the thing is called and who coined the term. So, as the saying goes, there are two hard things in computer programming, uh, caching, validation, naming things, and off by one errors. And naming things is by far the most important one of them um, in that respect. Back to my children's room example. So why you tell your kid to clean the room? Is it because you're so paranoid about cleanliness? No, it's because you're worried about the kid. You're worried that with time, as this room gets messy and dirty, it's going to be harmful for the kid. And would you argue if the kid gets a toy and put it here, but not there? It doesn't really matter. There are millions of different ways to clean the room, and you're not going to be arguing that it didn't do it exactly in the way you were imagining it, it would clean the room. What you want to teach your kid is to keep the room clean. To keep the room clean and tidy for the sake of its own health and, and, and safety. You want the room to be a safe and livable place for your kid. That's your motivation. So you need to explain the purpose of the exercise and not just saying, oh, put this there. Guess what? The same applies to software engineers and software design. It's not about I'm using this technique or this framework, and if I'm not using this technique or this framework, I'm wrong. It's about understanding that every single piece of code you write today will gonna get dirty and messy one day. And if you don't have the habit of constantly thinking of reorganizing things, of improving things, it's gonna get painful and, 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 and not a nice place. So the purpose of good application design is to keep your code safe and livable place. Thank you. Uh, just a, a little note. Uh, so the Q&A session will be held outside on the hip space stand. So yeah, you're welcome to talk to Milan about whatever you need. Thanks. Thank you. Guys.